data. Nice to see you. And um, nice to see you too if you're watching at home. Susie, just let me know when you think we're good to go. I think we're good. Good, great. Uh, well, um, what do you make of the Christmas story? The story of the boy laid in the manger. For many people, I guess, it is just that. It's a story, a fable, a fairy tale. The trimmings of Christmas, they get earlier each year, for the music, decorations, etc. One friend of mine the other day circulated a photograph from his local branch of Tesco. Um, Aero orange chocolate bars, quote, the perfect festive treat. And I think he um, suggested to the management that that might be just a fraction early at the, the time, the 3rd of September. The trimmings of Christmas get earlier each year, and yet the story is very easy to gloss over. Um, angels, shepherds, Mary and Joseph, Herod, the wise men, the king. To say it feels almost kind of sacrilege, doesn't it, to be talking about this story other than at Christmas, and certainly when it's 25 degrees outside. And yet our task this lunchtime is to consider the significance of this real life history, the miraculous birth of Jesus. Our task is to consider what it says about the identity of Jesus, that this is how he was brought into the world. And to that end, I think, the key verse down there is verse 22. All this, verse 22, took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophets. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. One well, I suggest on this sweltering September lunchtime that the story of Christmas is significant. That is, it tells us something. It's not just a fable, some silly festive story, the kind of thing reserved for school activities. It's not just an intro before we get to the really interesting stuff of Jesus and all the miracles that he did. These are events that proclaim to the world that Jesus is the Christ whom God had promised. He is God's appointed king. He's our king. He's the one with all authority. He's our saviour. He's our rescuer. He's our daily needed redeemer. And so I guess it's my hope this afternoon then that as we kind of head back to our emails in a few moments we will do so if we're Christians with a real sense of confidence. Those verses we've just had read, not a story, nor a myth, nor just some irrelevance, but a powerful proof of the identity of Jesus. And you'll see, um, I've got three headings down there on the sheet. If you're watching online, you can find the sheet by the website. A virgin birth was promised, Emmanuel was promised, a saviour king was promised, and let's begin with the first of those. It is without doubt that the events recorded here are totally unique in human history. Verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Just allow me to patronise you for a moment with a bit of basic biology. When a mummy and a daddy love each other very much, they tend to do more than just send WhatsApps. And um, certainly, if you want to start a family, you need to become, I guess, pretty well acquainted with your wife. But this birth in history bucks the biological trend. Bang, go the laws of nature. I take it in fact that it's exactly for this reason that from very early in the history of the church, the virgin birth has been widely disputed. Two things to say on that by way of response. The first is that Joseph himself was persuaded. Did you spot that? Um, his instinct, verse 19, his instinct is to file for a divorce, to, to call off the upcoming wedding. And of course we can understand that, can't we? I mean, how humiliating to marry a girl with a bump in her tummy. A girl carrying a baby that you know 
And everyone else in the village knows it's not yours. What the angel says is so persuasive, in fact, that verse 24, Joseph goes back on that plan. Verse 24, when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she'd given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. The second thing I think I just want to say on that is that if you just allow for a moment yourself to think that God might, in time and space, become man, well, we might expect a slightly irregular type of parentage. Well, dwell on a moment uh, about, on the claim that's being made about Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us. This boy, Matthew is saying, is our great God. I mean, impossible, surely, for God to come to earth and just be born normally of normal human parents. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. And yet the thing we really need to know in order to, to get these verses is that a virgin birth just like this was promised by God through Isaiah in the Old Testament. Um, if you've got a Bible at home, you might be able to get it out. If um, we're here, you've got a phone with the Bible. You might like to just turn back to Isaiah chapter 7, and we're going to chase up that verse Matthew quotes for us. Um, as you flick there, just let me give you the context. Isaiah chapter 7, these are perilous times for the house of David, perilous times for Judah, 700 BC. They are under threat both from Israel and Syria, they're also under threat from Earth, Syria, the world's great superpower. They're terrified, verse 2. They think they're going to be conquered, but God says, I won't let it happen. Isaiah 7, verse 10. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. And God said, Hear that, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men, that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. I have to say, I'm not particularly persuaded by that, not least because a woman giving birth, and that's I guess a woman giving birth, is not that significant. I guess it's significant for you, as I say, but um, it doesn't tend to make the national news of a woman who has slept with someone giving birth. Isaiah says, verse 14, well, this is going to be significant. The Lord himself will give you a sign. This will be something that people can recognise, something epic. Something remarkable from the God who can move heaven and earth. The impacts of promise, at least in the first place, is to give God's people comfort. The family line of David will continue whatever the immediate future holds. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Just to come back for a moment to that question with which we started. You know, I've often wanted to ask parents who've been to a kind of school nativity, you know, what do you actually make of the story? Um, not what do you make of Mary and Joseph, you know, the kids walking around with tea towels on their heads, but what do you actually make of the historical events that are being represented before you? Now, most, I take it, would just write them off as myth or as fairy tale. I can empathise with that. The problem is that Matthew reads to me like it is real life history. Um, place names, people's names, geographical details. It just doesn't read Matthew's gospel like it's fable or folklore. Now, if you're watching at home and you've never read through, account like 
Matthew's Gospel, I'd really, really encourage you to do so. You can find the text online. Drop us an email in the office. We'd love to send you a copy. And that being the case, you know, you've got to answer the question, how do you explain that a woman gave birth who had never had sex with anyone? I mean, how do you explain this miraculous conception that no one, least of all Mary, was expecting? Might it not be true that the best explanation is that it just fulfilled what God had promised? A sign from God, a proof of greater meaning. Surely this event must be significant. Second heading on the handout, Emmanuel has promised. Emmanuel has promised. And the word used back in verse 23 of our passage in Matthew's Gospel is the Greek form of the Hebrew word, in meaning with, El meaning in God. And it communicates the sentiment, not just that God is for us, like I might be for my football team, but rather that in Jesus, God is personally with us, present on earth, as a man, I think I've already suggested that I think this makes the best sense of the miraculous parentage of Jesus. Verse 20, as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. That which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. I think we've got to remove from our minds, just to be clear, any thoughts of a sexual union. Our um, Muslim friends are rightly appalled at the thought that there's some kind of liaison, some kind of carry-on between a holy God and Mary. The child she bears has been given to her miraculously by the Holy Spirit, verse 20. He is God come to live with us. He's God become like us. He's God like on Carney, but with me so on. Now the title Emmanuel, or at least the Hebrew version of it, is unique to Isaiah in the Old Testament. No one else uses it. Um, but the promise such a person would come from David's household most certainly goes far further than just Isaiah. I mean, consider for a moment those verses that I've popped down on the hand now, for example, verses from the Psalms. Psalm 2, the Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, I'll make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. You're my son, today I've begotten you. Or Psalm 45, the psalmist speaking, my heart overflows with a pleasing theme. I address my verses to the king. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever the sceptre of your kingdom, one of uprightness. There was right expectation that from David's household, God would come to rule as a king. The Messiah, the Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. And into this world came Jesus at Christmas. It gives us a new perspective, doesn't it, on that boy in the manger. All our sentimental ideas of little Jesus, meek and mild. Um, probably won't surprise you to learn that I first gave this talk at Christmas, actually, back at um, Snicks. And by that stage, I think I had sung something like 1,500 carols, although I cited lost the world to carry. So I was reading this talk yesterday. I mean, take this look. For example, away in a manger, no crib for a bed, the little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. You know? Ah, oh, little sweet baby Jesus. But this is the baby who is going to judge the world, who's going to judge all the kings of the earth, who's going to crush into pieces the earthly kingdoms. <laughs> This is the Son with authority from God, who himself is God, who will rule God's kingdom forever. It's 
little baby boy we're reading about in Matthew is not some sweetie. It's the boy's manual. God with us. And um, for reasons of time, we're not going to do it this lunchtime, but I'd love if we had more time to take you more um, deep into the book of Isaiah, to um, verses 14 and following in Isaiah chapter 7, verses which give us even more context of how God is going to come to earth. This boy named Emmanuel, our God come to earth, we're told is going to come to a nation that has been conquered and occupied. Isaiah 7, 19, humiliated. He's going to come to a land that's been utterly ravaged. The promise of Emmanuel was a promise of a man who would come to a people in crisis, who would be born into poverty, heir to a throne that was meaningless, born in a land that was conquered, quote the commentator. And now as the Lord Jesus comes into the world, he fulfills quite exactly those criteria. Son of David, tick. Conquered nation, tick. Rome at the time, the occupied force of Israel. Heir to a throne that is meaningless, tick. And can you see why Matthew is so persuaded that this baby boy, is the Christ. All this fulfills what was promised. And yet still, we haven't actually mentioned the big puzzle of the passage, and you possibly noted it as it was read out. Matthew 1, verse 21. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Verse 23. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Well, which one is it? Emmanuel or Jesus? God with us or God save us? You know, how can this birth be fulfilling a promise if the promised kid is named entirely differently? My two names. My two names. And just in the third of these points, I want to suggest that actually. These two names point to the very same person. Third heading, a saviour king was promised. The sign of Emmanuel was a pointer to God's faithfulness. I've tried already to make that point clear. It was a sign that the line of David was going to continue somehow. God was going to be true to his promise. But even more so, the sign was a witness to Israel that the Lord God had judged them as faithless. I'm back in Isaiah for one last time if you've got access to Isaiah chapter 7, second half of verse 9. If you are not firm in faith, says the Lord God, you will not be firm at all. Ahaz was a wicked king. Idolatrous, promiscuous, faithless. The coming disaster that would fall upon the land, Isaiah says, was a consequence directly of God's judgment. Emmanuel, this son, would remind us actually of Ahaz, a reminder of the nation that he was a bad king. I'm trying to think of an illustration for this. I guess you might think of the child born out of wedlock. You know, accepted by the family, lives in the family home, but a permanent reminder that mum had not been faithful. But it wasn't just King Ahaz who drew bright anger from the Lord. So too did all the people of Israel. 8 verse 6, because this people has refused the waters of Shiloh that flow gently, and rejoice over Rezin and the son of Ramalia. Therefore, behold, the Lord is bringing up against them the waters of the river, mighty and many, the king of Assyria and his glory. The people had been faithless. They moved on from God. They were sinful. They were wicked. 
they needed a rescue. And so when we hear in our Christmas readings of a king who's going to rescue from darkness, we are hearing a promise of salvation to sinners. We're hearing the promise of Emmanuel. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. For to us, 9 verse 6, a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The purpose of God coming into the world was always going to be to offer a rescue from darkness. Freedom, forgiveness, restoration of relationship, light, life, you might say eternal salvation. This is the kind of king that God had promised. As the angel says to Joseph, call this little baby Jesus. He is setting up the mission of Emmanuel. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, but he will save his people from their sins. When we were deciding what to teach this term, we had quite a long chat about whether or not to include this passage. As I said, it feels on a sacrilege, doesn't it? to teach Matthew chapter 1 at a time of year other than December. It feels like we should now kind of pass around some mince pies or something. But what better place to turn at the start of the new year than the start of the life of this man, Jesus? The story of Christmas is the cast iron proof that Jesus is the king the God had promised. God's freedom, forgiveness, restoration of, rela- restoration of relationship with God. He is God himself come to rescue people from their sin. If you're watching as someone today who doesn't know that for yourself, why not make this the year that you check out the place of Jesus personally? As I said, if you find Matthew's Gospel online, drop us an email, we'd love to help you out. I'm now going to end the word of prayer, and then we'll back it to um, Tom. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this wonderful story that testifies to the identity of Jesus. Thank you that he is our King, who you promised to send into the world. Thank you that he has come to rescue us from darkness. And we pray increasingly you've helped us to be really confident of his identity, confident that he is able to save people from sin. We pray you give us opportunities to proclaim him to others even this afternoon. And we pray it for his sake. Well, thanks for joining us this afternoon. We continue our series next week. We'll be here if you're back us. Um, this will be available online. If you're tuning in via Zoom, we'll have this talk available online as well um, for you guys to share with colleagues and that kind of thing. If you're on Zoom, I think we're going to chat now, so see you in a moment. There's no need to rush off. Lots of sandwiches left. If you're um, beginning to come back into the city, um, do make it a Tuesday. Come and help us eat sandwiches. Great to see you. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.